that your piece can take on that? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Welcome, thank you for coming. Thank you all so much for coming out on a gorgeous Friday night. I appreciate you being here. This is gonna be a really fun event. Um, I'm Starshine Rochelle, and um, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, uh, some of you know me from my column with the Santa Barbara Independent. And um, actually, since I'm mentioning the Independent, I want to acknowledge them as a platinum sponsor tonight because thanks to the Independent, um, and a couple of other platinum sponsors that I'm going to acknowledge, we are able to do this here tonight, which is amazing. Um, the Independent was a huge help, as was the Santa Barbara City College Foundation, which provided this venue. <laughs> and the wine, right? <laughs> exactly, as well as Montecito Bank and Trust. So how about a big hand for our sponsors? I also want to acknowledge um, a few elected officials who came out tonight. Um, we have Santa Barbara City Councilman Jason Dominguez. Where's Jason? Yay, thank you for coming. We also have former longtime Congresswoman Laura Capps. I mean, Lois Capps. Sorry. Okay. Thank you for coming, Lois. We also have um, a Santa Barbara school board member and a candidate for a Board of Supervisors, Laura Capps as well. And then we have Diana Villanueva. Where's Diana? Is she here? Maybe not here. Okay. Never mind that. Um, we also have, <laughs> we also have um, Michelle Sevilla for Assemblywoman Monique Limon. Thank you for coming. Appreciate that. So, so you know me as a columnist, but um, many of you don't know that I also manage media and communications for Field and Graduate University. Oh, one second. We also have former Mayor Helene Schneider. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate that. Anywho, I manage media and communications for Field and Graduate University right here in town. And um, I want to bring out someone who's gonna tell you why Fielding is involved in this event, if you don't know. And that is our Chief Diversity Officer, Tomas Leal, who flew here from Philadelphia to do this tonight. Sure, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I noticed that the wine uh, sponsor got the biggest applause. I like, <laughs> I like this group, I like this group. So anyway, so uh, bienvenidos, welcome everyone to, um, to this great event. It's, it's an honor and a privilege for me to um, welcome you and to make some very brief remarks, and I do mean brief, I was told they needed to be brief, uh, about Fielding Graduate University and our connection to this really important event. Fielding are celebrating our 45th anniversary, founded and located in Santa Barbara. We're, we're a distributed learning graduate university with several doctoral, masters, and certificate programs with students both in the US and internationally. Our vision and mission speaks directly to our foundation of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and the connection to social justice in not just our research, but in the practical work that we do in communities locally and globally. Social justice is at the core of our education of what we refer to as our scholar practitioners. Um, I attended the opening reception uh, on Wednesday night and that was quite a party. It was really a lot of fun. Uh, so, uh, and and I, I wanted to say that because I do believe in the importance of celebrating pride right, celebrating it with party and with good times. And I also feel that part of our celebration uh, is learning and building awareness about the issues surrounding our LGBTQ plus community, right? So I think it's a balance of both and most pride events, you know, globally have that nice, nice balance. Um, personally, 
as a Latino gay man, uh, I carry with me the lived experiences of these two vibrant communities, the gay community, the LGBTQ community, and the Latino community, and is a reminder of the intersectionality of all of our identities. As I read the, the bios of our speaker and our panelists, and read about the rich diversity and experiences that they'll bring this evening to us, uh, I remain hopeful that through these events, through these learnings, we will continue to educate ourselves and our community about the issues. Uh, so with that in mind, I invite you to engage in the learning with the panelists and the spirit of education and the power of action to continue to create change. So again, welcome, and I thank you for being here. So next up, to introduce our, our keynote speaker, I want to bring to the stage um, a Fielding alum and the hardest working woman in show business this week. So can we please have a big Pride Week welcome for the executive director of the Pacific Pride Foundation and a good friend of mine, Colette Shabram. <laughs> Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming to our intimate conversation, Perspectives on Pride. We at Pacific Pride Foundation are so proud to partner with Fielding tonight and to bring this community the 2019 Pacific Pride Festival on the 50th anniversary year of Stonewall. So Pride is an important time in our community, in a diverse, multi-generational coalition that is the LGBTQ movement, Pride is a time to take stock in our progress and our civil rights and to celebrate our achievements as a community. And this year, we honor those trailblazers that 50 years ago stood up to hate in order to make our communities, our bodies, our futures more safe and more equal. So as we honor these milestones, we also must recommit to our future together. Pacific Pride Foundation provides programs and services to more than 10,000 people in Santa Barbara County every year, and we are the largest LGBTQ center between Los Angeles and San Francisco. So tomorrow, we will host Pride at Chase Palm Park starting at noon for a day that Santa Barbara can feel proud of. I hope you all come along and participate in the diverse crowd of thousands, LGBTQ allies, supporters, as we stand with Stonewall. Tonight, our format is simple. Jim Obergefell will take the stage momentarily, followed by a panel discussion. If there's time at the end, we will take a couple questions from the audience. I am so honored to be introducing Jim Obergefell, a hero in our movement. Jim was the lead plaintiff in the Supreme Court case, Obergefell v. Hodges, one of the biggest civil rights cases of our time. It made it so that same-sex marriages are recognized across the U.S. in every state. I met Jim about five years ago before we knew the outcome of this crucial case. Jim was humble, he was grieving his husband, and he was seeking the right to be treated like any other married person in this country. But the state where he lived didn't recognize his legal marriage with a different state's license. He calls himself an accidental a activist, and with all due respect to Jim, I think he's so much more than that. Jim represents a modern love story, a struggle for equality, and a milestone in the LGBTQ civil rights movement of, of today. It is my absolute honor and privilege to welcome Jim to my hometown and to the stage of our city college. So will all of you give me uh, a little bit of a hand in welcoming Jim Obergefell. Thank you. Thank you so much, Colette. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you 
you're silly. Thank you so much. For, <laughs> thank you so much for that wonderful welcome. I am thrilled to be here. And Colette, Starshine, Fielding, Pacific Pride, thank you so much for inviting me to be here this evening. I am thrilled to be here. You know, I fell in love with John the third time I met him. The first time we met, I was still in the closet, and he scared the daylights out of me. <laughs> he was this out gay man who was comfortable in his skin, and I thought for certain when I first met him, he would see right through me and say something to let it slip that he knew I was gay even if I wasn't out. The second time I met John, I was newly out. I had left my teaching job and went to graduate school in higher education. And for the first time in my life, I found an environment where I felt comfortable answering that simple question, which I got in the back seat of a car. Are you gay or straight? And for the first time ever, I let myself say gay. And for those of you who have been through that experience, you know what that feels like. And that happened the summer I was 26. And I met John the second time shortly thereafter. You know, I was new to being out, new to being open about who I was. And here was John, this man who had scared the daylights out of me. And he said, well, Jim, you know, I don't think you'd ever go out with someone like me. I have no idea where I found the wit or the courage to say, well, how do you know you've never asked? <laughs> and he still didn't. <laughs> And he didn't. So the third time I met John, one of my friends had become his housemate, and they were having a New Year's Eve party. So our, my friend Kevin, who was one of John's housemates, invited me to John's house for New Year's Eve. Well, I went to that party, and I never left. <laughs> John liked to say for us, it wasn't love at first sight. It was love at third sight. <laughs> And that's really how it was for me. I knew from that third meeting, this was the man I wanted to spend my life with. I knew this person, John, would be with me for the rest of my life. I just knew it. I never questioned it. I just knew it. And so we built our life together. Now, John and I, over time, you know, we weren't activists in, in any way, shape, or form, other than writing checks. We would sign checks to organizations we cared about, and we would support them that way. But John and I were never activists. We just lived our lives. We were open about who we were. We worked together. Every coworker, every boss, every employer knew we were a couple. We just lived our lives openly and honestly. And we started talking about marriage early on, probably within, I think, the first two years we were together. We started talking about marriage. We wanted to get married. But John and I made an agreement. We decided that for us, marriage had to be something more than just a symbolic ceremony. We weren't going to get married and have it mean nothing. And we lived in Ohio, a state where it was impossible to get married, because like so many other states, it had its own version of the Defense of Marriage Act, saying that marriages could only be between one man and one woman. You could not get married in Ohio as a same-sex couple, and they would not recognize marriages from other states. So we made this decision. For us, marriage can't just be a symbolic ceremony. We'll only do it if and when it means something. And honestly, we never thought that would happen. We thought we would simply live our lives as partners, as everything other than husbands, even though we felt like husbands, and our family and friends treated us as, treated us as such. So our life together moved on. And in early 2011, things started to take a turn that we weren't expecting. I noticed as John was walking around our condo that for some reason, it sounded different, almost like one foot was slapping the floor harder than the other. And I asked him about it, thinking he had sprained an ankle, pulled a muscle, but he hadn't. And we thought, well, this will go away, but it didn't. And in May, June of 2011, after lots of doctor visits, specialist visits, John came home from seeing his third neurologist. And as he walked in the door, I jumped up, hugged him, and kissed him. And he started to cry when he said, 
our worst fears. This neurologist concurs it is ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. Now, if you don't know much about ALS, here's my quick definition or description of ALS. In a normal person, when your brain tells your legs, I'm going to walk, your legs walk because all of the messages from your brain get to the muscles in your legs, your feet, everything involved in, in moving your body. Well, with ALS, those connections start failing. So even though your brain is saying, body, I want to walk, some of those muscles stop getting those messages. And that's what was happening to John. What I heard, that slight change in the sound of his walk, was foot drop on his left side. Moved from his left foot up his leg into his left hand. Then his right side started to join along with it. ALS is a one-way trip. There's no cure and no effective treatment. And most people die within two to five years of diagnosis. Now from the start, John was the one who approached this in a much more, let's think about the future, Jim, let's plan ahead. He was always the dreamer, the flighty one. I was always the more grounded, more realistic one, but we suddenly switched with his diagnosis. And he was the one who said, Jim, I'm never gonna get better. So let's start thinking about what we need to do to make sure you're okay when I'm gone. So he was the one who said, let's sell our condo, buy a different one, because the one we had was two floors. The building wasn't very conducive to someone who would be losing his abilities. And he said, but when we buy that new place, my name won't be on it, Jim, only your name will be, because I don't want you to have any issues when I'm gone. So John was starting to think to the future, while I was so focused on, I'm going to lose the love of my life. The person I thought I was going to spend decades with, I've already had almost 20 years with him. I thought I was going to have many more. And when you love someone, you take care of them, right? So as John started to lose every ability, he started by using a, a cane that moved to a walker. And within a year, he started to use a wheelchair. And every ability, he started to lose. And less than two years after diagnosis, he started at-home hospice care. And I was his full-time caregiver. Now, caring for someone who's nearing the end of their life, caring for anyone with a terminal illness is hard. It's tiring, it's scary, and it's overwhelming. But I couldn't imagine doing anything else. There were people who said, well, Jim, I think this is great what you're doing, taking care of John. And I don't have much of a poker face, so I'm sure they knew exactly how I felt about that statement. But I would reply, well, what else would I do? This is the person I love. This is the person I've committed to. We've never been able to get married, but we've still made those promises to love, honor, and protect each other. And so I was fortunate enough and had a job where I could work from home and take care of John 24-7 other than about five hours a week when hospice came. June 26, 2013, I was working at the dining table and John called me into his room to say, Jim, there's news coming out from the Supreme Court about the Windsor case. Now, Edie Windsor, she and her wife, Thea, they had been together for more than four decades. They got married in Ontario and Thea had MS. And when Thea passed away from MS, Edie got tax bills from the state of New York and the IRS in excess of $800,000. Because they said, sorry, Edie, you're not the legally recognized spouse of Thea. So even though you've gotten all of her estate, we have to tax you as if you're a stranger. Edie said, well, this isn't right. And Edie, my, my hero, she became my friend. She, said, this isn't right, this isn't fair, it isn't just, and she sued. And on June 26, 2013, I was standing next to John's bed, holding his hand, when the news came out that the Supreme Court struck down the Windsor, struck down the Defense of Marriage Act with the Windsor decision. And they said, at, now at a federal level, the federal government will recognize same-sex marriages. I hadn't planned on doing this, I hadn't thought about it, it wasn't anything John and I had discussed, but in that moment, in that wonderful moment of realizing, here's our chance to actually have at least the federal government say we exist, I leaned over, hugged and kissed John and said, let's get married. 
Now, luckily, he said yes. <laughs> but again, here we were in Ohio, Cincinnati, Ohio. And in a perfect world, I could have put him in his wheelchair and taken him six blocks to our county courthouse for a marriage license. But it wasn't a perfect world. Ohio said we couldn't do that. So I had to figure out, how do I take this dying man to another state simply to do something millions of others take for granted? So I started researching where we could go. And we eventually settled on Maryland because it was the only state that allowed same-sex marriage that did not require both people to appear in person to apply for the marriage license. My whole goal in this was if I had to take John to another state, I want to make that trip as short as possible and keep him as safe and as comfortable as I possibly can throughout the whole thing. So Maryland made that easier. I could go get the marriage license, and then John and I could travel to Maryland to get married. Now, right after I proposed to John and he said yes, I did one other thing. I reached out to his favorite aunt, Aunt Paulette. Aunt Tootie's her nickname. Years before, Aunt Tootie told us, she said, guys, you, in my opinion, represent marriage better than any other couple I know. And if you ever have the chance to get married, I want to be the one to do it. So Aunt Tootie went to the internet where she clicked the ordain me button. <laughs> Aunt Tootie was a bit more optimistic than we were about our future chances of getting married. So I reached out to Aunt Tootie and said, Tootie, do you, re do you remember your offer to marry us? Does that offer still stand? And Tootie said, absolutely, Jim. You tell me when and where. I will be there ready to do this. So we knew where we were going. We knew who was going to marry us. Had to figure out, well, how do we get there? I couldn't take John to the airport and fly an American or Delta. That just wasn't doable in his shape. And I wasn't willing to put him in an ambulance to go from Ohio to, Mass to um, Maryland. So that left really one option, a chartered medical jet. Now, I hate to break the, the suspense, but those things aren't cheap. <laughs> we could afford it, but I thought, well, maybe friends, maybe, maybe somebody, maybe friends or family member have a contact. So I went to Facebook. This is about the only positive thing I'll ever say about Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> I went to Facebook and said, hey, John and I are going to get married in Maryland. And we have to do a chartered medical jet. Does anyone have a contact? Do you know a pilot, someone who works for one of these companies? And the most amazing thing happened. Our family and friends immediately started replying, sorry, Jim, we don't know anyone like that. But you and John deserve to get married. And we, we want to help make it happen. So please accept this gift of cash. Our family and friends covered the entire $14,000 cost of that chartered medical jet. Nothing happens on its own. If it weren't for our family and friends, I'm not sure this would have happened. But they wanted us to get married, and they wanted to be part of it. So John and I flew to Maryland with Aunt Paulette in this cramped medical jet. We landed at BWI Airport. And we never left the airplane. We just simply parked on the tarmac. And I got to hold John's hand. And we got to say those words we had wanted to say for 20 years. I be wed. I do. And it really was the happiest moment of our lives. A lot of people say, well, you know, after 20 years together, does it really make a difference when you get married? Yeah, it does. I can't describe it other than to say we felt better, we felt different, we felt more complete. I get the feeling some people out there agree, <laughs> understand that feeling. And it really was the happiest moment of our lives. Now, one thing that we had, we had agreed to before we left, a friend of ours worked for the local newspaper, and she was on the editorial board. And she said, Jim, I've been pushing the paper to come out in support of marriage equality. John and Jim, I know you're going to get married. Would you be willing to? have me write a story about it. So also meeting us on the tarmac in that chartered medical jet was a videographer who took photos and video of our marriage. We got married on a Thursday. Two days later on Saturday, that story came out online. It was going to be in the Sunday print paper, but it came out online the night before. And friends of ours were at a party where they ran into a friend of theirs, a local civil rights attorney named Al. And our story came up in conversation. And our friends, Barb and Mike, said to Al, you've got to go read this story. It just came out. It's online. And they talked about what John and I had 
gone through just to get married. Well, Al left the party without telling his wife and went back to his office and started pulling out paperwork. Turns out when that Windsor decision came out, he had put his entire office to work trying to figure out how can we take that and use that to attack Ohio's Defense of Marriage Act. Then our friends got in touch and said, Jim, our friend Al, who's a civil rights attorney, wonders if you might be willing to talk to him. So on Tuesday, five days after we got married, Al came to our home. Now, Al is this amazing civil rights attorney who has fought for prisoner rights, women's rights, reproductive rights, LGBTQ rights in Cincinnati, and he's done it for more than four decades. And he's kind of rumpled and just kind of disheveled, but he came into our home and he just simply sat down and talked to us. And he pulled out a piece of paperwork, a blank Ohio death certificate. He said, no, guys, I'm sure you haven't thought about this because why would you be thinking about this when you've just gotten married? But do you realize that when John dies, his last official record as a person, this death certificate will be wrong. Ohio will say he's unmarried. And Jim, your name won't be there as his surviving spouse. Now, he was right. We hadn't thought about that. We knew Ohio wouldn't recognize our marriage, but that was an abstract understanding. This piece of paper, John's death certificate, his last record as a person, that made it real, and it made it hurtful, and it made it harmful. So Al simply said, do you guys want to do something about this? So John and I discussed it, and once again, John was more worried about me. He said, Jim, yeah, I think we should, but I want you to understand this is all on your shoulders. He was completely bedridden. He's like, I can't do anything, Jim. This is all on you. He said, I think we should, and if we do this, I'm okay with you going to court. I'm okay with you doing whatever you need to do, taking time away from me. Because that was a way for John to thank me for taking care of him but also a way for him to fight for our marriage. So we told Al, yeah, let's do this. So we sued the state of Ohio and the city of Cincinnati because both are involved in marriage licenses. And our legal argument in Ohio, if an underage couple wants to get married or first cousins want to get married, they cannot get a marriage license in Ohio. But if they get a marriage license, let's say in West Virginia or Kentucky, as soon as they crossed the border into Ohio, Ohio recognized their marriage. And they treated that marriage exactly the same as every other marriage, even though they could not get married in Ohio. So our legal argument was, state of Ohio, you're creating multiple classes of people, and that's unconstitutional. So 11 days after we got married, I took the stand in federal court, and I got to read a statement to the judge. I got to talk about John, what he meant to me, what our marriage meant to us, and what Ohio's Defense of Marriage Act meant, how it hurt, how it harmed us. And at five o'clock that day, federal judge Tim Black released his ruling. And in his ruling, it started with this sentence, this is not a complicated case. He f ruled in our favor said, Ohio, when John dies, you have to recognize their marriage on his death certificate. Three months later to the day, John died. But he died a married man. He died knowing his death certificate would say he was married. He knew his death certificate would say, I was his husband. And I know that gave him some comfort at the end of his life to know that our marriage meant something, that our marriage existed, that our state recognized us as valid. After John died, of course, my life kind of fell apart. It wasn't easy losing the love of my life, but I did the best that I could and I just kept going. Now, Al, he kept going as well. <laughs> he had a second case, which was all about the beginning of life. He had six same-sex couples with children. They either gave birth in Ohio, adopted in Ohio, and they sued the state of Ohio to say, guess what, Ohio, our kids deserve accurate birth certificates, listing both parents' names. They went before that same federal judge, and they also won. Now, I will tell you, from the start, Ohio, and then when we got to appeals court and to the Supreme Court, 
the states kept arguing, well, you know what? These Defense of Marriage Acts are constitutional because the people voted on them. A majority of voters voted for them. And I'll never forget Al in our very first hearing, when that argument came up, he said, the surest way to abridge the rights of a minority is to allow the majority to vote on them. <laughs> now another thing, Al got a lot of pushback from national organizations saying, don't do this, this is the wrong case, don't do this. This case, John and Jim's case, doesn't fit our, meaning the organization's, strategy to win marriage equality. They wanted him to drop it. And Al said, I'm sorry, I have clients who are being harmed and my job as their attorney is to do this. I will not drop this. And that's one of the challenges when you have a lot of organizations out there. A lot of organizations think their way is the only way, the right way, and they will push back. And that's exactly what we experienced. But Al said, nope, sorry. My duty is to my clients, not to you. And he won them all over. So now, we won. The birth certificate case won. And then once John died, the state of Ohio appealed to the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. They had to wait until he died before they could appeal. And at that point, our case, along with four cases from Kentucky, Tennessee, and Michigan, were consolidated with our case. And we went to the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. Now, we were warned right from the start, don't get your hopes up, this is one of the most conservative appeals courts in the nation. So we went to the Sixth Circuit, and in December of 2014, they ruled against us. Now for me, that was the low point. John had been gone for a, a little bit more than a year, and we lost. And that was the moment when I could have said, you know what, I just want to go back to my quiet life. I was never an activist. I'm not sure I want to keep being this public face of this fight the name and face, but I couldn't do it because if I dropped out and said, no, I don't want to pursue this, I would have been letting John down. I would not have been living up to my promises to love, honor, and protect him. So when Al said, do you want to file cert with the Supreme Court? I said, absolutely. Now, you might not know this. The case is called Obergefell v. Hodges, but we were a consolidated case of eight different cases from four states. There's no magic way it became known as Obergefell v. Hodges. The reason it's called Obergefell v. Hodges is Al filed cert with the Supreme Court 10 minutes before the Tennessee case did. <laughs> it was all timing. But I also have to tell you, I would have been okay had it been one of the other plaintiffs who got in there first, because the one plaintiff in Tennessee, his last name is Love. And I thought, how perfect would that be? We had Loving versus Virginia, and now it could be Love versus Tennessee, whatever the case name was. But we beat, but Al beat them by 10 minutes. So it became known as Obergefell v. Hodges. <laughs> <sighs> it's really weird to be told there's a Supreme Court case with your name on it. But I knew I had to be in that courtroom for oral arguments. There was no question in my mind. I had to be there for the full two and a half hours. The Supreme Court said, okay, you have an hour and a half to argue the right to marriage, and you have one hour to argue the right to recognition. But I wanted to be in there for the full two and a half hours. The court was setting aside seats for plaintiffs only for the hour and a half or the hour, not the full thing. So Aunt Tootie and I sat on the sidewalk, or stood on the sidewalk in front of the Supreme Court to be in the courtroom in the public seats. I couldn't have John with me, but having Aunt Paulette with me made it feel like he was there. And we were in that courtroom. Now, we were sitting on the public seat so people didn't know who I was. And eventually, it came out. I don't know if someone recognized me or if Tootie said something. But I love this story. And this is one of the things that I always tell people. Stories matter. It's that one-on-one -on -one conversation with people that you have that actually changes hearts and minds. And the best thing we can do is tell stories. Harvey Milk said, come out, tell your story. And that's so true, because in that courtroom, the man I was sitting next to told me, Jim, I have to tell you, your and John's story really affected someone I know. I have a twin brother. He's a Roman Catholic priest. He called me this morning on my way here to the courthouse, and he said, Rob, 
I watched a story about the name plaintiff and his late husband, and it's really made me rethink my opposition to marriage equality. A little bit later, Rob is saying that same thing to Aunt, pa Aunt Paulette, but he said, John and Jim's story really affected two people. And I thought, well, you told me about your brother. Who's the other one? Rob then turned to me, shook my hand, and thanked me for fighting the right fight and told me that he's an evangelical Republican. You could have knocked me out of my chair with the feather. <laughs> you could have asked me, name one type of person who will never thank you, who will never be on your side, who will never thank you. Evangelical Republican was right at the top of that list. Yet here he was telling me our story made a difference. So that was one of my most meaningful experiences in that courtroom. And the other thing I love is during oral arguments, again, those same things came up. You know, if you allow this, straight people are going to stop getting married. Straight people are going to stop having children. <laughs> Never did quite understand that one. <laughs> If that happens, that means one of you's gay. <laughs> but then one of the Supreme Court justices brought out that other tired argument. You're trying to change the definition of something that's meant the same thing for millennia. You're trying to change, you're trying to redefine marriage and make it mean something new, something that it's never meant before. And Ruth Bader Ginsburg, she can have any organ of mine she needs. <laughs> She jumped right in and said, I'm sorry, we have already redefined marriage because women are no longer the property of their husbands. So I sat through that two and a half hours and then I knew, well, it's gonna be at most two months before we get a decision because that was end of April and the Supreme Court's term ends in June. And again, I wanted to be in that courtroom when the decision came out. So I started going back to DC in mid-June to sit in that courtroom for decisions. June 15th, no decision. June 22nd, now the court only officially schedules decision days on Mondays. They won't tell you what decisions, just that they will release decisions on Mondays. They can add other days. So I was there Monday, June 15th, Monday, June 22nd, no decision. We left the courthouse thinking, well, it's gonna be Monday, June 29th. Well, as we're standing in front of the courthouse, someone came running out and said, well, they just added Thursday, June 25th as a decision day. Someone else came running out, well, they just added Friday, June 26th as a decision day. And at that point, we all looked at each other and said, it's gonna be Friday. June 26th, the Windsor decision came out on June 26, 2013. Lawrence versus Texas, which struck down sodomy laws, came out on June 26, 2004. So we thought, well, it's got to be Friday, June 26, because there's no other reason they'd add Friday as a decision day. So I got back to the courthouse Friday morning, and I'm on the sidewalk, and the atmosphere is different, the mood's lighter, people are, we're all feeling pretty optimistic. And the police officer came by to hand out the tickets for the courtroom, for the public seats. And they'd done this every time I'd been in that courtroom. And they hand them out, and we're all talking, and I look down and I notice, Huh. Nobody else has commented on this, but the ticket's different this time. Every other time, the ticket for the Supreme Court was bright orange. On Friday, June 26th, that wasn't bright orange, it was lavender. <laughs> we were already optimistic, but at that point, we said, it's happening today. <laughs> And I will also say one of the things I still makes me upset is when you get to the courtroom door, they take the ticket. So I don't have my lavender ticket number one. <laughs> so anyway, sitting in that courtroom and the session begins and they read our case number and I'm seated between two friends and I just jerk in my chair and make some noise and grab their hands. I'm like, oh God, here it comes. And Justice Kennedy starts to read his decision. And my initial reaction is we won and he kept reading, and it's legal writing, so not always the clearest. And I found myself thinking, well, did we really win? I don't know. 
And then it hit me that we did win, and I burst into tears. And all around that courtroom, people were crying. Al was there on the other side of the rail, closer to the bench, and he said, Jim, I have never seen so many attorneys crying in a courtroom. And of course, my first thought was, John, I wish you were here. I wish you could experience this, know that we won. And then that was followed by this unexpected realization that for the first time in my life as an out gay man, I felt like an equal American. So Justice Kennedy finished reading his decision, and if you haven't read it, read the last page. Or if you've been to a same-sex marriage since then, I think there's a law now that every same-sex marriage has to include that last page. <laughs> I, I know I've read it a lot because I now officiate weddings as well. So, But that last page of writing is beautiful. It's a beautiful piece of writing, and it talks about what we fought for. Not law, not something legal, but love and commitment and family. Read it if you have a chance. So Justice Kennedy finished his decision, and then the Chief Justice read his dissent, which I merely ignored. Like, we won, I don't care, keep going. And the whole time I'm sitting there thinking, let us go, let us go, because I want to walk down those steps of the Supreme Court building. Because in my mind, I had this image of Edie Windsor and other plaintiffs on the front steps, and all I can think is, let me go. Let us go. Finally, the hearing ended, and we're all gathering out in the hallway, some of the other plaintiffs, the attorneys and I, and we're getting ready to leave when suddenly police officers go running out the main entrance. But nobody said anything, so we start walking that way, and another officer stops us, said, sorry, you can't exit that way. You have to exit the side of the building. And my internal conversation went along these lines, what do you mean I can't exit that way? That's the way everybody gets to walk out when they've won in the Supreme Court. Oh well, guess we have to exit the side. The crowd had pushed past the barricades and they were up on the steps of the Supreme Court building. So from a safety point of view, they did not want us going that way. So we exited the side. Al and I were arm in arm leading our group of plaintiffs and attorneys and we walk up onto the plaza into the crowd as it just split in front of us. People were cheering, people were crying, singing, giving us hugs, high fives, and I mean, the air was electric. I don't think I ever really understood what that could feel like, but I certainly felt it that day. It was electric. And we made our way through the crowd to where all of the press was gathered so we could read our statements to the press. And I finished that, and I step away, and I have an interview with a CNN reporter. And as soon as I finish that interview with the CNN reporter, I turn around, I'm facing the Supreme Court building, and someone hands me a phone, Jim, you have a call. President Obama. <laughs> as I'm trying to hold a conversation on speakerphone with President Obama in the midst of this celebratory crowd. So I talk with President Obama, Vice President Biden called and went to voicemail. <laughs> he did call back. I hung up and then I had, as you can imagine, interview, interview, I mean, countless interviews. The first question almost every person asked me was, I saw the president called. What did he say? What did you say? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I really had no clue other than it was, I remember him saying something along the lines of, Thank you, Jim. You and your husband helped make the world a better place. But I'm so glad that happened in front of that CNN crew because they got it all on tape. <laughs> and a few days later, the White House released a video, and it's a split screen. The president sitting at his desk in the Oval Office on one side of the screen, me in front of the Supreme Court on the other, and it's our conversation. And I watched it, and I breathed an enormous sigh of relief. I did not sound like an idiot. <laughs> I was respectful. <laughs> but you know, you never expect to get a call from the President of, of the United States. And that one part that I can remember him saying, you and your husband helped make the world a better place, that really resonates with me still because this whole experience wasn't something I had ever thought of, ever planned. John and I did not go through a selection process. We were not interviewed. 
we were simply people who got married and an attorney happened to realize we had a problem that we hadn't thought about. There was nothing planned about this. It just simply happened because we were in a situation, met the right person, someone we trusted, and someone who put, put this in a way that made sense to us and also made us say, you know what, no, we are not putting up with this. Our relationship, our marriage, deserves better. And relationships like ours across the nation deserve better. So to have President Obama say, you and your husband help make the world a better place, you know, I think everyone as a kid you hear growing up, one person can change the world, a couple people can change the world. I think most of us hear that and think, eh, whatever. Well, I've learned that it is true, because I lived it. And it wasn't just me. It was John and me. It was more than 30 plaintiffs in our case. Another widower, a funeral director, couples, children. The youngest plaintiff was a two-year-old boy named Cooper, who still calls me Uncle Jim. His dads live in Manhattan, but they adopted him in Ohio. We, as a group, fought to make our world a better place. We fought to have our relationships matter, to mean something. And that's what I still think about, is that that's not just a tired old cliche that one person or a group of people can change the world. It does happen. And that's what helped me get through this, was being part of that group. We became a family. They, they supported me and helped me through the loss of my husband, but it was also realizing this has become so much bigger than just John and me, so much bigger than our marriage. This impacts people across the nation. And it also impacted people across the world because other courts around the world will reference Supreme Court decisions. So it's amazing the impact you can have when you find yourself in the right place and you're willing to say, yes, I'm going to do this. Even though it scares the daylights out of me, I've never thought I would sue the state of Ohio, the city of Cincinnati, never thought I'd be in the Supreme Court, and I certainly never thought I'd have a landmark civil rights case named bearing my name. But it was the right thing to do. And I think back to that day when Al said, do you guys want to do something about this? You know, here was John dying. We didn't know at that point he'd be gone within three months. But it didn't matter. It could have been within a week, and it was the right thing to do. It was such an easy decision to say, yes, we want to fight for each other and our marriage and for people like us. And in our current world today, that's what we need to keep fighting for. We have to keep fighting for each other. And it isn't just about me. It's about so many others. And I'm realizing I have gone on way too long. <laughs> no, so. <laughs> My apologies for going on so long. But you know, that's really all I've, I want to end on that, that when you find yourself in a situation where you have a choice, you can do what's right or you can walk away. Don't walk away. Do what's right. Because when you fight for what's right, when you fight for love, and that's all I did, I fought for love, an awful lot of good can come out of it. So thank you so much for having me here tonight. And again, my apologies for going too long. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's an amazing story. That could go forever. So we're going to set up the chairs for the panel now. And while we do that, I just want to remind everybody that the Pride Festival is tomorrow. So I hope you'll come out to that. It's at Chase Palm Park, just down the road from noon to 7. And it's free. And it's for all ages. And it's super fun. Who's been? Who's been to the Pacific Pride Festival? Woo! Who's going? Who's going tomorrow? Yay! I'll see you there. 
So Fielding has a booth, there's entertainment, there's food, it's a lot of fun. If you haven't been, it's a really good time. So you should definitely go. And Carol's pouring wine. <laughs> okay. Um, I also wanted to let you know if you got a photo taken um, tonight uh, by our team and you want to, and you didn't get one of these little cards, um, you will be able to download the photos in a week or so at fielding.edu slash pride. And if you have friends who are interested in watching the panel, we are live streaming right now at youtube.com slash fielding graduate univ, U-N-I-V at the end. So it's youtube.com slash fielding graduate UNIV. And then one more shout out to our sponsors who are amazing, Santa Barbara Independent. <laughs> Santa Barbara City College Foundation. Woo! And Montecito Bank and Trust, thank you so much. When we told them we wanted to do this event, I, I was shocked. Every single place we called was like, we're in. We're in there so fast. What do you need? How can we help you? And it was just an outpouring of love, and it was wonderful. So thank you so much. Okay, I guess we're set. And this time, I'm going to call our panel up. Are you ready, Hannah? Come on out. Sit where you like, except for that. That's Ellen's seat. <laughs> All right, so we just heard from Jim. We heard his story. Um, Ellen Broidy, if you would come up and join us as well. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, their bios are in the program, but Ellen it was a co-founder of the first Gay Pride March and a member of the Gay Liberation Front, and she'll tell us all her whole story. Um, but I also want to... In <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. We're going to be brief. It's going to be great. Um, we want to invite Dr. Aiden Hirschfeld. Please come up. Sit wherever you like. Aiden is a, a fielding grad. He graduated um, in media psychology, and he did his dissertation on transgender studies. Really interesting stuff. Maybe he'll tell us about that, too. And we want to invite Anaya Bhutan, please. <laughs> Anaya is 14 years, 14? 14 years old, and she's the Pacific Pride Foundation's Youth Advocate Leader this year. So thanks so much for being here, all of you. And this is going to be conversation style, so I'll direct questions to individual people, but um, I want you to feel free to jump in if you have something to say, okay? Um, we, obviously, we deliberately invited a panel of all ages because we wanted to really look at LGBTQ plus rights from different multiple perspectives. Um, and, and so the first, the first thing before we get to that is I want everybody to kind of tell us their story of, in, briefly um, <laughs> of how you came to engage with, with, with the Pride community. What, what do we need to know about you that's not in your bio in the program? Um, let's start with you, Ellen. <laughs> a, movement, a movement that did not start out as a pride movement. It started out as a movement for liberation, and there probably are some uh, subtle differences there. But I have been involved in this movement, however you want to call it, since probably 1965 or 1966, starting uh, in an organized way with the first, with actually the second student group dedicated to LGBT. We didn't have the other letters in those days. We, we, were sort of, um, we had a diminished alphabet. <laughs> <laughs> but the second group, university-based group, that um, was dedicated to our rights and our liberation. And I kind of like to think that I have been um, in this fight all those years. I get tired sometimes, but looking at the panel and hearing Jim, I actually energize again. So I thank you. Yay! Um, I'd have to say, um, I grew up uh, a large part of my life in Louisiana, which is not very uh, accepting mm -hmm. of queer people, and my family, for the most part, wasn't very accepting. Um, was both really not accepting of being queer. 
So I tried a long time to say uh, act straight or make it seem like a possibility for me to be straight, but uh, it happened. So when I was able to move to Santa Barbara, um, I came out uh, before I went to seventh grade, um, and then I got in touch with the Civic Product Foundation, and they made sure that your voice is heard and put you in areas where you can explain your story, tell your story, mm -hmm. and reach out and help other people that are in situations like you. So yeah. Nice. Thanks. Thank you. I've already, already talked, talked way too much. much. No, no, it's great. It's great. Yeah, yeah, I think I have a very similar story to you um, that I was in high school and there was this like very isolated GSA and it was a GSA at the time. You know, they, we didn't have queer at the time. What's, what's GSA? Gay Straight Alliance, right. So it really was like that, um, an opportunity for people who felt, you know, they wanted to be part of this group, but there really wasn't that, uh, there was still a lot of stigmatization about my community and about my identity. So I was actually the first person to bring a girl to prom at the time, so I'm trans, so I, I was a girl the time and so I brought a girl to prom and that was the first time ever and that was just a really ex exciting experience and it kind of facilitated a lifelong dedication to to this area and to inclusivity and diversity and um, really it wasn't until college when I was in a lesbian sorority which is actually kind of like a queer sorority and um, we I met my first trans person who was happy who was successful in their life and it, they weren't this kind of identity that I had had a, like predetermined in my head I was going to be if I had come out. So it was a few years after that that I was really inspired to be like, okay, I can do this. Um, and I transitioned and, and it was just really since then I've just been involved in the community a lot. Thank you. So we know that, that LGBT history goes back as far as humans go back, but for the purposes of tonight, we wanted to focus on Stonewall because it's the 50th anniversary this year. Um, and Ellen, I, I wondered if you would sort of set the scene for us, for those in the audience who may be fuzzy on the details of what Stonewall is. I know you weren't at the incident itself, but I've heard you say that Stonewall was a moment and out of it grew a movement or something like that. So if you would kind of tell us how that erupted and how you were involved. The bars would be raided at, with some regularity, and they'd be raided for a number of different reasons. One of the common reasons was the payoffs to the cops didn't come through in a timely enough <laughs> manner. Other times they'd be raided because the city was planning, um, there were going to be a lot of conventions and tourists in town, so it seemed like a good idea to clean up the streets. There are lots and lots of reasons that have been thrown around about why on the evening of June 28th, the 6th precinct, which was the police precinct in that area, decided to raid the Stonewall. One thing that is not true is it had nothing to do with Judy Garland's funeral. Okay. <laughs> This, this, is, this is a myth that has been <laughs> floating around for 50 plus years. Normally when these raids happened, people would quietly leave, or as quietly as a bunch of queers could do anything. <laughs> On the night of June 26, 1969, something happened. For all I know, it was Judy Garland's funeral, but something happened, something changed. We don't know who threw the first penny, the first brick, the first punch. People fought back. They fought back from being pushed into the paddy wagons. They, in fact, trapped six police officers in the building in the Stonewall. If you've ever been in Greenwich Village and seen it, it's a fire trap now. It was a fire trap then. You did not want to be trapped in it. At any rate, the first evening this happened, people fought back. 
people fought back the second evening, the third evening. It went on for something like four nights. People taking it to the streets, saying, you cannot do this to us. Within months of this happening at the Stonewall, a group called the Gay Liberation Front started. The first and most radical of the political groups that formed after the incident at Stonewall, the rebellion at Stonewall. I don't call it a riot. I call it a rebellion. And why I say Stonewall was a moment, it was a moment that allowed a movement to happen. And I'm pleased to say this movement has kept going and growing and growing and going. And I thank all of you for keeping it going. Thank you. That was, that was a story well told. I really like that. Thank you. And I, I wanted to ask you, you traveled to New York with Pacific Pride Foundation recently for the celebration about the anniversary of Stonewall. And I wanted to know from, so we've just heard from Ellen, um, sort of at the other end of the spectrum, what was that like for you? What did you, what did you learn there that you didn't already know about the movement? Uh, well, one of the amazing things that we were able to do, we were able to go and see Stonewall which was amazing because you hear about it, right? And you know that it's such a important place of history and meaning, but to actually be able to go there and be in the energy and be able to fill the stones and just exist in the same place as it is something that's unbelievable. Um, and I still just can't believe that it was able to happen. Um, but. I think one of the most important moments to me, not even being in the march, because we were able to march in uh, at the Pride March, um, but one of the most amazing moments was being able to sit down with the GLF and talk to them, because it was us eight youth advocate leaders, ranging from like, I think senior was like the oldest age, and then we had an eighth grader, which was like the youngest, and it was just us and talking to some of the original members of the GLF, and being able to communicate beyond generation boundaries, which is something that sometimes is very complicated because there's so many differences and the way that we see each other is sometimes skewed to a point where it's uncomfortable for a lot of people. So being able to sit down in a room and just try to understand each other mm -hmm. and hearing their knowledge and experiencing things with them, but also them hearing what we have to say about how the world is now to us, mm -hmm. which just... We'll talk about that for a minute. That's interesting. So what, um, it sounded like there was some, ten there, there was some t natural tension, maybe, but what, but, but, but I want to ask what, what do you appreciate about the generation before um, and how, how they handled what, what they were faced with? Uh, I think, just to quote on the tension, um, a thing that we were afraid of going into, because most of our group were is under the trans label, with the, the non-binary, gender fluid, mm -hmm. agender, mm -hmm. binary, whatever, um, a lot of us were under one of those labels, so we were scared on the way that they were going to perceive and understand um, the existence of them because it, sometimes it's harder with older generations mm -hmm. for them to understand and they say like trans is a new thing or don't they exclude them mm -hmm. from the entire community so that was like just our fear going in but everybody was amazing with it and they asked questions they tried to understand our point even if they didn't completely understand where we were coming from or what we were giving them the information, they still sat and listened and cared. But um, honestly, the way that they talked about um, a lot of them going to the first Pride, mm -hmm. I think is amazing because uh, we talked to them, I think two days before we actually marched in Pride. So they were telling us how it obviously wasn't helped by the police and everything, like, and it wasn't guarded, and you were just walking through the streets without any help, getting spit on, get thrown at, whatever, whatever, whatever. And being able to go through that and push through and continuously just walk and, and have a point of doing it, mm -hmm. that was just powerful. Mm -hmm. It gave our walk meaning. Mm -hmm.
Tomas mentioned earlier about how it's important to celebrate, but it's also important to educate and talk about, you know, um, things that that we're learning and study. And um, one of the things that you know, one of the things we talk about at Fielding a lot is we is one of the things Fielding's known for is psychology. And you know, in psychology, we know that racism and bias are internalized through media and and the broader culture. And we also know that it can be um, reduced through training too. And so, Aiden, I wanted to kind of ask you about that a little. I know that you do scholarly research in that area. Um, and I wanted to find out kind of what you've learned about psycho our, our psychological understanding of bias and, and how that might be used or is, or is being used in research that, that might benefit the community in terms of cultural understanding and even the furtherance of rights down the road. Yeah, absolutely. So um, because my focus is on media psychology, that's kind of where obviously <laughs> I'm going to talk about. Um, and I have, you know, a couple cool things. You know, I think part of it is we have to understand the role that we play in the in communication, in communicating our beliefs and our bias and things like that, and our internalized bias and our um, microaggressions that we commit. You know, as people who don't understand and are just not exposed. And so, a lot of what I study is the impact that not media just has on the you know, the uses and gratifications that trans people and non-binary people um, turn to for media, but also how that affects others. And a great example is there's been a lot of research on like why, you know, why do people even use media? What, what are they turning for? You know, um, are they on there to, you know, explore identities? Are they on there to understand transition options? Um, but really what they found was that media was that a, a, an opportunity for them to communicate complex and challenging things to others and with others and to have those difficult conversations that would otherwise be potentially dangerous in their face-to-face -face situations, right? And so media plays this incredible role in allowing us to kind of mediate those experiences. But on the opposite end of it, you know, when we look about the way that we internalize things, just on one example is a recent study came out looking at gay men's body image issues, right? And what it, they learned from that was that gay men internalize body image issues the same way that women internalize body image issues. And it has the same effect not only on them, but on the people who they share with, right? On everybody on Instagram who sees their selfies that have been filtered out and things like that. So we're perpetuating this in the things that we do, obviously, but we're also internalizing what people are giving us as well. So I think, you know, we have this incredible opportunity with media to, to change the world. And a great example is um, recently I was with the Chicago PD and we were doing um, virtual reality experiences to teach um, police officers and first responders about mental health issues and about diversity and inclusion in these things. And they're getting to live these experiences in virtual reality environments and that codes in your brain as real as a real experience and so for so them to have they were yeah. they were living what experiences so they were living out like um pulling over someone who potentially had a mental health issue um engaging with someone who had um, schizophrenia various different issues of that nature um and going through the um, scenarios, so making decisions in that experience. And so those are ways that we can, in the future, shift bias and really change the perception. And just like storytelling, you know, I love that you brought that up, is that stories are the number one most important thing. And I truly do believe that. And I think in my own work, in my own future research, I want to use storytelling. I want to use virtual reality experiences to change the way that we see ourselves and to change the way that we see others as well. That's great. Thank you so much. I kind of want to hear from you all on this, but I want to start with you, Jim. What do you think is the most pressing or immediate needs in, in your community that you see of the people you interact with in the community um, from, from policymakers? So I think one of the biggest things, and you know, all of you here in California, you're lucky. You live in a state with non-discrimination protections, so many other things that people across the nation don't enjoy. I moved back to Ohio because I've realized in this current political climate, being in DC trying to do things at a national level, not so easy right now. <laughs> but the place you can really have, have an impact is at the local level. So I moved back to Ohio because I wanted to make sure that I was helping my state, my home state, move forward and one of the things that I think is so important are non-discrimination protections because it's inconceivable to me that 
in so many states around our nation, a couple can get married, put their photo up at work, and get fired because they don't have non-discrimination protections or they can lose their apartment. So that's, I think, one of the biggest things we have to fight for is non-discrimination protections nationwide for people based on gender identity and sexual orientation and, and gender expression. So that's vitally important. And also we have got to ban once and for all everywhere conversion therapy. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's nothing more than child abuse and it has to end. And our transgender siblings, they they can't live their lives without fearing for their lives. And I don't know how we fix that, but to me those are, you asked for one, but to me I think those are the three most important things that we have to work on across our nation and especially at local levels because if we change it to the local level, that's going to be changed that last and, is, and spreads. So those are the things I think are really vital right now. Anyone have anything to add? Yeah, I'm going to speak now generationally. I think there has been a perception fostered by the media that the LGBT or the gay community made up of upper middle class white men who have all kinds of resources. My generation, the GLF generation, the Stonewall generation, is full of people who have very, very few resources. A lot of women who had no resources then continue not to have resources. Where are we going to live when we age? Yeah, that, that's vital. And that's one of the main reasons I joined the board of directors for SAGE, which is the oldest and largest organization fighting and advocating for LGBTQ older Americans LGBT. It means senior action in a gay environment. Exactly. Yeah, we, we, don't, we don't use that anymore. That's what it was to start with. But, you know, older LGBTQ Americans are far more likely to age in isolation. And we have to fix that. We have to make sure that when it's, when it's time for, we all get to that point where we, we need to think about where are we going to live because we need health care, we need services, around the nation, there, there are people who have to go back into the closet because they can't be out in that facility. And that's one of the things these, these religious refusal bills, these so-called religious freedom bills out there are especially damaging because 85% of long-term care facilities in the United States are religiously affiliated. So if you give them the right to say, no, we don't want you because you're a gay man, no, we don't want you because you're a lesbian, no, you're a same-sex couple, you cannot live in our facility, that's putting a whole lot of people at risk, serious risk. So that's vital. And for me personally, I owe it to the people who came before me, the people who really put their lives on the line to get out in those streets and march they created a world where I could feel comfortable saying, yeah, let's sue the state of Ohio. I owe it to them to fight, and that's, that's a big reason I, I joined that board, because it's a scary time for far too many LGBTQ older Americans. I'm gonna ask you, what, what are best practices for allies? I had some, a couple of friends asked me to ask you guys, like what, what do well-meaning cis straight people need to know in order to be more supportive and effective? You any advice? Uh, I was just going to say um, allyship is obviously needed. You can't fight the fight alone. Yes, we have gay people and we have queer people, LGBT people fighting, but you have to have some of their help also. So we need you. But an important thing to remember and to realize is that yes we need you yes we need your help you're there to lift us up and get us seen 
but that means that you're holding us up and you're not at the top of the pyramid. Mm -hmm. So you have to make sure that you're letting the people's voices that need to be heard, heard. Mm -hmm. It's because it's a, something that continuously happens in a lot of different communities of minorities where other people come in mm -hmm. and yes, you're helping and thank you, but you're kind of taking up more space than need be. <laughs> we do we don't need we don't need allies straight explaining for us. It's <laughs> a new word. Anaya, you started a, an LGBTQ plus club at Santa Barbara Junior High, right? Yeah. And did you talk about that issue there? Were there allies in the club, and did that come up? Uh, yeah. How did you manage that in a junior high setting? <laughs> <laughs> well, junior high. Um. <laughs> Uh, for the straight people that were there, it was because most of them were friends. Our, our GSA, and GSA is, uh, I want to say this, uh, GSA is uh, Gay Straight Alliance, but it also is now a lot of the times recognized as Gender Sexuality Association or whatever they add at the end of the A, because extra. But um, uh, a lot of the straight people that were there, it was because they were friends with someone that was there. Mm -hmm. So they were being allies. Uh, there were other people that weren't. They're supposed to be there. But most of the time, it wasn't really them just trying to support it. We, our GSA was a safe space. That's it. Like It wasn't this organized big thing where we were constantly talking about issues, but we did. Mm -hmm. And we did bring up a lot of issues every once in a while for, since we were the older ones, we made sure that they would understand and see a lot of things in the world because we had different experiences and we like to make sure that you can say and do whatever you need. But it was just a place where you know that you can be here if you like theater stuff if you're like sports if you it doesn't really matter who you are what you're doing you can be here and you can just have a good time and no one will mess with you you can just exist right nice that sounds like a nice place i wanted to ask if any of you have questions to ask each other up here on the panel No pressure, no pressure. You don't have to. I just thought I'd throw that out there just in case. Yeah, I, yeah, I have a question. Did you get to meet any of the justices? Did you get to meet <laughs> RBG? I, no, unfortunately, I haven't met any of them. You know, they, they, there's no like, let's go meet the justices and let's hang out in the courtroom. Have a beer. The Supreme Court, they could care less about plaintiffs. It's all about the attorneys and Definitely before it, there's no way I you would ever have a chance to meet them, and I haven't yet. Maybe one day. Ellen, you, I'm going to open it up to questions in just a minute. But Ellen, I was I had coffee with Ellen last week, and she told this amazing story that gave me chills. Would you tell that story about being on the the float at the parade and how surprised you were by the experience? The Gay Liberation Front was one of the five grand marshals at the World Pride Parade in New York. And there were several of us, my spouse, Joan and myself amongst them, who have some mobility issues. So we were on a float, which was actually a um, U-Haul flatbed truck. It was very <laughs> elegant. It was just <laughs> extreme, extreme. When I say we don't do glitter, we don't do glitter. <laughs> and we were sure, it, it said, Gay Liberation Front on either, uh, banners on either side of the truck. But we were sure that people, you know, would sort of wave and not know who we were, why we were there. We turn on the first corner to the line of march and there were literally three million people in the streets behind these barricades. And people are standing there seeing Gay Liberation Front and screaming, thank you, thank you, thank you. Fists in the air, hands on hearts, block after block of thank you. And the only response that we could come up with from this U-Haul flatbed truck <laughs> was no, thank you. You're still there in the streets. We've been marching for 50 years. 
you're still marching. And I wanted to say one other thing about that. Joan brought a banner from home, a rainbow flag that said, love trumps hate. They went wild about that <laughs> also. So we really were stars of the moment. But seeing people going like that was, I think we were all crying at that point, as were people in the streets. Thank you. So, um, so if I could have Hillary and is Elena here? Yes, we're gonna have um, Aiden and Ellen, if you could hand these ladies your microphones and then what? you guys can share. <laughs> you can share, you can share. And um, if anyone has a question for the panel, Yes, why don't we have Stacy Christopher over there. So, um, living in a very divisive time right now where civil liberties are being attacked, um, not just daily, but hourly, right? Um, <clears throat> there seems to be two camps, like all you need is love and rebellion. So, living your journey, what's your opinion on rebellious acts versus acts of love or that can interchange with one another or do you feel like one type of action is more needed now than another? Who wants to take it? I don't want to do it. Um, I think that you, which you can see from different civil, civil rights acts um, in the past, like uh, use um, the entire civil movement with black people, right, or black rights. Um, you have the two sides with like the all love, we're protesting peacefully, doing everything with like Martin Luther King, right? But then you have the militant, the we're fighting back because there's no way that they're gonna listen to us unless we fight, right, with the Malcolm X. So you have two sides that they coexist at the same time. Maybe one might be seen higher than the other because you hear about Martin Luther King a lot more often. But without both of them fighting, um, nothing would have happened. So you need both sides. Yes, we have to have peace, love, trying to make sure that we love everyone, but we also still can't just love and take the hits without trying to fight back because then you're just going to be sitting there love but beat up on the ground you know <laughs> that's not really going to get you anywhere so you need both sides because you can't also just just go in straight with hate because then we're no better than them so you have to have both sides i think i think in the current political climate, the current dangerous political climate, our act of love is an act of rebellion. There's not a whole lot, of, and I think that's what, there's not a whole lot of difference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Other questions? What was the Supreme Court vote? It was five to four. When I left oral arguments, I walked out thinking it was going to be 6-3. Don't ask me why, I can't explain it, but I was disappointed it was 5-4, but we still won. <laughs> Certainly would not happen that way today. And, and I will say, a lot of people ask me, Jim, are you worried about marriage equality with the current court? And I will say this, the only thing that gives me a little bit of calm thinking about the current court. If something ended up in front of this court the way it is currently right now, even though Chief Justice Roberts was against us, he was part of the four, I think he's a stronger believer in precedent and not taking away rights that have been previously granted by the court. So what gives me hope is thinking if something showed up in front of that court in its current condition, I think he would switch and say, no, we are not overturning Obergefell v. Hodges. If, if the court changes more, all bets are off. And there have been too many changes in federal courts across the nation to feel very comfortable. Last questions. I promise everybody we get out of here by eight. We have one in the back there.
Yeah, um, my question is just for the whole panel. So, Aiden, you mentioned that in college there was a person that you met that was trans and um, you saw that person being out and happy and that really affected you. And I was wondering for the rest of the panel and for Aiden if there's someone else, is there anyone else um, that you want to give thanks to or that you think deserves some gratitude that we haven't brought up tonight? I mean, I can, I can also double on that. I think there, <clears throat> and there's, this is interesting that you asked this too, is um, one of, um, recently I've been working with uh, the homeless population, the youth homeless population, and which is like 80% queer, um, which is like a horrible fact that haunts me every day. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that they say when you're working with youth is that j it just takes one person to have a conversation with them and treat them like a human and treat them authentically to change their lives. And I find that in a lot of my work with LGBTQ youth, that's still the case. And that's the case with me. And I think that, that that's the case across my journey too. You know, it wasn't until I met a non-binary person who really lived that identity that I felt like could be me for me to adopt a non-binary identity and to adopt they, them pronouns. So I think it still happens. You know, I think I still have to either. Just to try our best to get there. I guess I do want to mention somebody, uh, which is very strange, hardly a feminist icon, a man named Craig Rodwell, who in 1967 opened up the Oscar Wilde Memorial Bookshop in New York City in the heart of the NYU campus. And Craig was a small town boy from the Midwest who called himself a simple shopkeeper. And he opened up my eyes and made things like the student group at NYU possible, the Gay Liberation Front possible. Lots of things were possible because, as Jim has said over and over again, somebody took a chance. Somebody simply said, yes, I can. And that was Craig for me. Well, here's to those people, and I want to thank our esteemed panelists so much, and our sponsors, and I want to thank all of our volunteers tonight at Took a Village, and I want to thank all of you guys for coming out tonight and staying and asking great questions. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you.